Welcome. This is Brian Buchanan from the Department of Critical Care Medicine from the University of Alberta. Today we're going to talk about lung ultrasound and critical illness, a topic that is near and dear to my heart. This talk is adapted from a rounds given in early January of 2017, lung ultrasound for the modern resuscitationist. It all starts with the case of respiratory failure. This is a mid 60 year old who presented with history of COPD with shortness of breath. Based on this chest x-ray, they were presumed to have congestive heart failure. And so the patient was given Lasix and placed on BiPAP as they were quite severely dyspneic. Unfortunately, on BiPAP, the patient continued to deteriorate. IC was called, the patient was intubated in collaboration between emergency medicine and critical care. And the, event, and the intubation was overall pretty uneventful. However, post-intubation, the patient had a PA cardiac arrest. And uh, this is quite a predicament uh, based off uh, the situation. Certainly, pneumothorax is on our mind. The, the intensivist at the time applied lung ultrasound and found this particular finding in concert with some other findings. Now, we'll talk about why this finding is important, but let's just say a percutaneous needle was placed on the left side with a gush of air followed by a return of spontaneous circulation. So I know for those of you sonophiles who are familiar with ultrasound, you're probably well aware the sensitivity of chest x-ray for pneumothorax is actually quite low in comparison to lung ultrasound here. But for those of you who are newly learning this technology, this is of critical importance as even life-threatening pathology can be missed by conventional radiographs and by clinical exam, as we know already. Auscultation, in fact, has a 58% sensitivity to detect pneumothorax. In fact, post-intubation, we know that 60% of mainstem intubations have equal breath sounds. So this is where we need to diverge in our training. Ultimately, I think we can be better. I think our current tools have rather significant limitations in the supine and hemodynamically unstable patient. This is where the role of lung ultrasound can help us be better intensivists and acute care resuscitationists. The expert resuscitationist in lung ultrasound would have versatility and be facile at diagnosing pneumothorax, interstitial edema, atelectasis, ARDS, and pneumonia. So how do we perform lung ultrasound? Well, there are really four cardinal points on either side of the thorax. Number one being the anterior chest wall midclavicular line. Number two being anterior axillary line. Number three being mid axillary line. And fourth being posterior thorax or posterior chest wall, commonly referred to as a plaps point for reasons which I will not go into. You can use a really a variety of probes, but most commonly employed would be the linear probe as it has high resolution for the pleura and the phased array probe as its versatility is pretty much unmatched in the point of care world. So how do we actually perform it? Well, we typically perform it in conventional radiological fashion with the head being screen left and the feet being screen right. In this case, in the sonographic image, you can see that there is a rib pleura rib shadow, which is fairly characteristic of lung ultrasound and is standard anatomic position. There are really four important lung ultrasound findings that, that really if you can master, you can diagnose a variety of lung pathology immediately at the bedside. So the four findings I want to talk about today are lung sliding, A lines, B lines, and hepatization, or the C profile. Let's start with lung sliding and A lines. So in lung ultrasound, we commonly talk about lung sliding. Now this, this white arrow is pointing to the area where we see sliding. This really means that the parietal and visceral pleura are abutting and they're sliding. You see this scintillating hyperchoic line that goes back and forth. And this means, again, the pleura are in apposition and they are normally sliding to and fro back and forth. Now, you may notice there are more lines beneath that. And the green arrow is pointing to what's commonly called an A-line. Now, this is a reverberation or basically a duplication artifact of the pleural line to the probe. And therefore, you may see many of these. And this is due to a tissue-air interface. And this is really reflects a healthy tissue air interface or normal parenchyma beneath. So it really means a pleura is opposed, the pleura is unfused, and there's no pneumothorax. And these are really three points I want to emphasize 
that become important as you understand how we use this for its clinical significance. We can use lung sliding to confirm tracheal intubation and to exclude mainstem intubation on either side and to exclude post intubation pneumothorax. As we can see here in both images, post intubation, we have lung sliding demonstrated on either side of the thorax. We can look for this pattern before and after line insertion and thoracocentesis. This can really expedite the diagnosis of the pneumothorax. The absence sliding, this is a little more nuanced. So obviously pneumothorax, which makes sense because there is no pleural apposition, therefore there cannot be sliding. Mainstem intubation, so if you intubate the right main stem, you'll have no sliding on the left. Apnea stands to reason, but also pneumonia can cause generally focal loss of sliding uh, in selected areas associated with some consolidation or dense B lines. Atelectasis can also occur frequently at the bases in a critically ill patient. Finally, pleurodesis. So if a patient has had a chest procedure like a thoracotomy, they may have an absence of lung sliding in one area or in fact even entire hemothorax, particularly post empyema. The bottom line is the sensitivity is higher than the specificity. Now we can actually increase the specificity by looking for several other findings, which we will go into. So in this case, I'll ask you if you think you can see sliding in the left side image. So I can tell you there is no sliding there. This patient had a pneumothorax and had a chest tube placed. On the right side of the image, tell me if you can see sliding. Yes, there is sliding here. Again, you see that scintillating line. And actually, occasionally you see a B line come in on screen right. And again, B lines can be helpful to rule out a pneumothorax at one site. Again, when we find the absence of sliding, this really rules out pneumo at that site. Now, if a patient is supine, we commonly look anteriorly as air tends to rise in the thorax. If a patient is sitting upright, we commonly look at the apex of the lungs because this, again, is where air tends to rise. This finding is particularly important. It's called a lung point. The reason why this is important is it actually demarcates an area between sliding, which is the green arrow, and no sliding on the white arrow. And this is the exact point at which we see loss of pleural apposition, which means this is the transition point between no air between the pleura and air. In this case, the patient was supine, and therefore air tends to collect anteriorly, reflected by the white arrow. This is highly specific for pneumothorax. And so if you see this finding in a patient who's, again, hemodynamically unstable, and you have a high pretest probability of pneumothorax, this can be a very helpful finding to rule in a pneumothorax. There are other findings to help rule out a pneumothorax, including B lines on screen left, and lung pulse on screen right. Lung pulse reflects cardiac oscillations that are reflected to the abutting pleura. So why is lung sliding with A profile so important in respiratory failure? It really helps you hone in on specific differential diagnoses including COPD, asthma, pulmonary embolism, and also a variety of other neurological and metabolic disorders. And we know that technically in patients who have a diffuse A profile, of lung sliding in A lines, in fact, they're very unlikely to be volume overloaded. It's not impossible, it's just much, much less likely. Next, we'll go into B lines. So thoracic B lines. Characteristics are they often ablate A lines where they cross, so they always take predominance. They go from the pleural line all the way down to the far field. We recommend a depth of around 10 to 12 centimeters to ensure that the, the lines go all the way from the pleural line all the way to the far field. They move with lung sliding. This is also very important. When we see acute B lines, fluid is almost always the cause. So if you, see a, if you saw a patient at point A who had A line predominance and at point B had B line predominance, as I mentioned, this is almost always likely due to interstitial edema. We, we often say that pathological B lines are greater than three at one site. In this case, we can see an apical four chamber. I hope you all agree that there is a rather severely reduced left ventricular ejection fraction. This patient, in fact, had a cardiomyopathy and acute heart failure. When we see a reduced left ventricular ejection fraction, reduced LV systolic function in concert with B lines, 
The likelihood ratio of congestive heart failure in pulmonary edema is around 30, which is very high. Beeline differential, acute respiratory distress syndrome, pneumonia, especially when it's focal, atelectasis and collapse, and finally, and rarely, lymphangitic carcinomatosis. The sensitivity of beelines for pulmonary edema is extremely high, around 94 and 92% respectively. In comparison to chest x-ray, which interestingly has sensitivity which ranges from 14 to 68%. Finally, on hepatization, are the C profile. So let's go through and dissect this image. So we can see here that if it's on the right side, this should be the head and this should be the feet. The liver is displayed here beneath the diaphragm. Now above the diaphragm in normal healthy lungs, we should expect to see that A profile pattern, which we commonly see displayed across the chest. The occasional scant B lines. In this case, we see something very different. The white arrow is pointing towards the parenchyma. It's pointing towards rather consolidated parenchyma, which looks almost like liver. In this case, we call this tissue-like or hepatized. This pattern is not specific to pneumonia, and it can also occur in things like atelectasis, which can occur in a, in a severely ill supine patient, or even in association with pleural effusion. Now the green arrow points to something that's very different. You can see again there's these scintillating lines that go to and fro back and forth. These are dynamic air bronchograms, and this reflects a tissue air interface where there's intense scatter and reflection. Dynamic air bronchograms are highly specific for pneumonia and often seen in, in infective consolidation. The blue arrow here is pointing towards a cylindrical anechoic structure. And if you recall from previous discussions, fluid in ultrasound is anechoic. And these structures seem to follow the air bronchograms, if you look closely. And so this is in fact the pulmonary vascular tree. So take home points. Lung ultrasound is simple, it's fast, it's repeatable, it's non-invasive. Practice is really critical. And you need to get a certain number to make sure that you're well acquainted with the normal lung findings. We talked about a variety of lung ultrasound findings from sliding to A-lines to B-lines and hepatization. We talked about lack of lung sliding and I would encourage you to use great vigilance because you need a certain number of normals and abnormals to really train your eye to recognize when this is a problem. Context is everything. It's critical to recognize that lung findings cannot be used in isolation. We can use lung sliding post intubation to confirm tracheal intubation and to exclude pneumothorax. Thank you for listening. You can follow me on Twitter at UAlberta Care Ultrasound. You can also look at the International Recommendations for Lung Ultrasound by Volpicelli et al. in 2012. And at the excellent review by Philip Vignon for critical care ultrasonography in acute respiratory failure. Bye for now.